Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Mickelson, Executive Vice President of Investment Sales at Walker and Dunlop. I, uh, I'm looking at my Zoom screen here and I see the number of attendees continuing to grow. Uh, I'm hoping that upward trend doesn't uh, reverse. And uh, as these additional viewers realize that this isn't one of Willie's uh, Wednesday webcasts, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. We're, uh, we're hoping you're enjoying the content that we're curating here at WND, and we're committed to our efforts to remain on the forefront of thought leadership in the industry. So in the spirit of thought leadership, we're gathered here today to discuss our observations in the BFR and SFR markets. We'll spend a quick minute outlining WD's history in the space and our approach to client coverage. We'll touch on the size of the market, reiterating the scale of the opportunity, putting that in context of the overall housing market. Uh, we recognize that many of you are familiar with the narrative supporting the demand story. That's why we've seen equity capital form and commit to the strategy at a breakneck pace. So we'll, we'll move through that relatively quickly and focus the conversation on our observations about where there are gaps in the financing market in hopes of laying the foundation with capital providers on the call to find ways to fill those gaps. Many of you have seen the announcement through various marketing channels that we formed a, a dedicated practice group at WND to cover the SFR and BFR space. Uh, the 16 men and women on the page here represent our national coverage across debt, capital markets, equity, agency finance, proprietary capital, and investment sales. Several of these team members bring seven or eight years of experience in the SFR and BFR space. Uh, as you can imagine, that experience uh, has uh, made them very popular members of the broader WD production team over the course of the last few months. As it became more clear uh, that BFR in particular uh, would be one of the significant trends accelerated in a post-COVID environment, this team was formed and really began meeting regularly in June of 2020. Uh, there was a significant uh, amount of capital dedicated to the space. While there has been a significant amount of capital dedicated to the space, um, it remains a somewhat nascent sector. So we feel this practice group with open communication and collaboration covering multiple geographies across the full capital stack provides a better resource for our external clients and partners. Some of you have asked the question about exactly how the production team is, is covering this space. I think it's important to emphasize that we take a partnership approach to these opportunities. Uh, so to the sponsors on the call, you can view uh, the team on your screen here as an additional resource to your existing Walker and Dunlop client manager, leveraging the broader experience of the platform to best ensure uh, quality execution, really whatever your needs might be. I'm joined today by my two colleagues, Keaton Merrill and Heather McClure. Keaton is an MD in our capital markets group. He's based in Phoenix. So as a result of being based in a market that was really the birthplace of SFR, uh, Keaton is one of w ds most experienced uh, BFR and SFR professionals. Heather is also a member of our capital markets group. She's based in Dallas. And along with her partner, Chris Harris, is an important member, an important part of w ds equity and structured finance group. Heather and Chris, we're active in the space prior to COVID uh, in sourcing a large programmatic JV equity assignment that closed at the end of 2020 and have a number of additional mandates currently in the market. We'll hear more on that in a bit. In, a, in addition to Keaton and Heather's active pipelines, I would just take a moment to reiterate the level of activity that we're seeing across the WD platform. Uh, the size of our practice group creates over 50 collective years and in a relatively new space. And, as you can see, that's resulting in a very full pipeline with over $4 billion worth of debt, equity, and investment sale opportunities in the pipeline. Uh, we'll touch over the following slides and in the following conversation about where the capital is coming from. Uh, we'll share some of the more common structures we're observing, uh, but most importantly for this call, uh, really focusing on spending some time with, with Keaton and Heather on where they feel uh, there might be a potential void in the market. The next series of slides attempt to kind of point out and put numbers uh, to the market opportunity and provide some additional data points that support the resiliency of this asset class. One of the themes that we're discussing on our team is the importance to look at the holistic housing picture versus the sideload convention of multi versus for sale. 
for those of you who have not had a chance to listen to Willie's webcast from earlier this month with Ivy Zellman and Diana Olick, I highly encourage you uh, to watch the archive or go to the Driven by Insight podcast and give it a listen. As I listened to Ivy share her observations on the arc of the single family market from 2015 and 2016, when the production builders, and I would probably add the conventional department developers as well, started going to the exurbs in an effort to deliver more attainable housing. You know, that arc bending to the early 2020, where we saw market inventories, you know, really already at an all time low to the present situation, where you have inventories down another 25 to 30% from their pre COVID levels. You've seen home prices surge 10% over the course of 2020, a forecast for another 6%, 6 to 8% increase in 2021. It's, it's clear that the housing shortage and affordability issues are, are, are massive issues facing the country. So despite the steady growth in the single family rentals, which you, know, you see on this slide, uh, now represent about 12% of the total housing inventory. It's around 17 million homes. The obstacles facing first-time home ownership, coupled with the demographics and secular trends and housing choices in a post-COVID world, uh, we feel the market is still drastically undersupplied. It'll come as no surprise to many of you on this call that the majority of our activity in this space is really centered across the Sun Belt. This table reflects single family and rental townhomes as a share of the overall rental market across 20 or so markets. Given the timetable, this is really reflecting changes from 26 to from, excuse me, from 2006 to 2018. The majority of this pickup was really the aggregation of scatter site FF, SFR. If you look at the most recent census information, you'll see that up to 10% of newly constructed homes are purpose built, build for rent. If we take a moment and we combine scatter site SFR with purpose built, build for rent, you can estimate the total size of that market at around $3.4 trillion. That's essentially at parity with the conventional multifamily market of 3.5 trillion. Uh, where we are today is we're, we're in the very early innings of the institutionalization, if you will, of the rental home market. 55% of that you know, conventional multifamily or around $2 trillion worth is owned and operated by institutional investors. You juxtapose that to you know, just 2% of the single family market being institutionally owned and operated, you see the massive opportunity for growth. You know, historically, we've lacked sufficient transparency into the market and questions and concerns around the effective or efficient management of operations have persisted. We now have the ability to peer in to establish single family REITs and see not only their historical resiliency, but also steadily improving historical occupancy trends, and also take note of the impacts of the rapidly increasing demand that we've seen in a post-COVID environment. I'll take a pause here and I'm gonna invite Keaton and, and Heather into the conversation. Heather, I think it'd be you know, helpful for the audience to hear a little bit about some of the consistent themes that you're discussing as you're outsourcing equity for your clients in the build for rent space. Thanks so much, Chris. Well, we are seeing an increasing number of equity players entering this space. Most of these groups are dedicated to housing in the US and view BFR and SFR as additive to their existing housing investment strategies. In general, the metrics would suggest that SFR and BFR outperforms traditional multifamily, at least in this part of the cycle, with resident retention, certainly of a stickier tenant base, had groups quote you know, from 30 to 50 months um, on average of resident stay. We have a slightly higher chunk rents, but on a per square foot basis, you're getting significant, it's lower. So you're getting more space for you know, an equivalent amount of rental payment. And then interesting trends in the expense ratios because some of these SFR and the BFR developers are starting to adopt some of the SFR aggregated site management techniques, which is very technology focused and then drives down some of those expense ratios. Um, Keaton, did you have anything you wanted to share in terms of what you're seeing on the metrics or shall we? Yeah, just uh, as Chris said, I've been in the BFR space for a while now and 
it really has a lot of positive attributes that make it just a great asset class. So I'll start with these three points on this slide. So resident retention being number one, if you're a resident in a BFR unit, your average stay in that unit is 5.6 years. So average stay is 5.6 years. So low turnover. Uh, per square foot rents, if you're in the same submarket as a garden style, traditional multifamily, you're typically outpacing them. And I'll use a Phoenix example here. Uh, we financed a three-story garden walk-up with Freddie Mac uh, that is next door to a 120 unit build for rent project. The garden walk-up is getting a buck 19 in rents. The build for rent next door is 100% occupied and has a waiting list and they're getting a buck 90 per foot on their two bedrooms and over $2 on their ones. And then on expense ratios, as Heather said, we've seen them be extremely low. I've seen as low as 20% expense ratio. The highest I've seen so far is 36, but generally they're running in the high 20s. Thanks, Keaton. Those are great trends. So as Chris had referenced earlier, with only 2% of the single family rental market institutionally owned, the data is hard to collect. There's not as many comparables that you would see in terms of sales comps or rent comps. So Keaton's basically out creating a market whenever he's talking to lenders. But we did decide to look at two of the larger publicly traded single family REITs just to give you some good metrics. And I think it's a reasonable proxy for the SFR as well as for the BFR as well. So we looked at and listened to the earnings calls for invitation homes and for American homes for rent. To put those two groups into size and scale, which I had not done previous to prepping for this call, invitation homes at 80,000 homes is in the top five owners for housing, rental housing units in the U.S. But if you look at NMHC's 2020 rankings. I mean, obviously they're not listed because they're not counted in that group. But if you look at those total number of homes, they're on par with Equity Residential and Avalon Bay in terms of number of units. American Home for Rent has 53,000 homes and that would rank them in the top 20 with the same number of units as say Camden Residential and Lincoln Property, which is just astounding uh, that they've aggregated. So using some of their data allows us to demonstrate just how resilient this product type has been. Because if you think about 2020 as a, a challenging year for many owners, Invitation Homes ended the year at 98.3% occupancy. American Home for Rent ended at 97.3. And those are great occupancy levels. And they weren't giving up rent to get them. So their renewal rent growth was both of them averaged about 5% in the fourth quarter. But they're in their new lease rent growth, which granted, you know, they don't have very many new leases to do if you look at it. But Invitation Homes was at 6.9, and American Homes for Rent was at 7.6% increase. And that flows through to their bottom line. Um, their collections remain strong throughout COVID, which was obviously in many groups of the multifamily industry, are, you know, they struggled with collections during that time period, but these groups were able to show resilient cash flow. And ultimately, their same store revenue growth for both groups was about 3% which all of these metrics are relevant because it shows you whenever you're looking at your underwriting of various a, a single family built for rent project, that these assumptions are, you know, are good. I mean, the, the fact that there's gonna be rent growth, and granted it doesn't last forever, but at the same time, it is an exceptional product class and they've shown exceptionally resilient during the, um, during the downturn. Um, some other interesting pieces that we've gleaned from those earnings calls and we certainly, heard over and over, kind of over the last you know, 12 to 18 months as we've been in the space, average downtime for vacant units is only 30 days. Um, both groups were announcing a build for rent strategy where they were going to, to pursue a, a development strategy in order to increase the number of units they had under, um, under ownership and management. America's Home for Rent is actually a little bit ahead of Invitation Homes in that strategy. They have a $625 million joint venture with JP Morgan, which contributed about 1,600 units to their portfolio last year in new, new homes. They have 10,000 lots currently under control you know, on their balance sheet and through that joint venture, which shows a, you know, a significant commitment to this strategy of build for rent. So we'll move on down to... Um, you know, once we get into the bill for rent on the next slide, you see that we have a lot of different equity groups moving into 
built the rent. We could have some groups that have been in the SFR space for a while, but as we move to this more purpose-built communities, be they horizontal multi or single family residential, there's an increasing number of groups that are joining. So the um, hunt companies are in their developing and Iron Point partners. We have PCCP partnering up with CalSTRS. JP Morgan, you know, as evidenced by their um, joint venture with um, American Homes for Rent is active. There are smaller groups that family offices, institution, um, you know, smaller private equity groups, high net worth. I mean, there's just an influx of capital on the equity side flowing into this. Chris, do you have, I mean, I know you're on as many calls as I am. Yeah, I, I think that the interesting thing about this space is it continues to evolve, Heather, it, in some ways, you know, trying to draw parallels to the multifamily space. Um, you know, a lot of the capital that's been aggregated and the strategies that are being deployed right now, uh, in, in the in the early days, it, it, it felt as though the, the merchant build strategy was picking up steam. And I think that, you know, the, the more broad scale adoption of the thesis, larger capital providers, uh, kind of took on the the more you've seen uh, really kind of a, a, a an expedited build the core strategy where capital that that really wants to to, to own these assets eight 10 12 years is finding its way to the development pipeline and you really see something that is you know almost similar to the evolution that we went through over the course of the first few years post GFC in urban infill multifamily development where, in the early stages, it was a lot of merchant build activity, and you saw that rotate into uh, more build the core orientation. Uh, feel like we've seen that start to transpire here, uh, just you know, really at a quite a condensed time frame. It's been much more accelerated uh, than than really what we saw coming out of the life cycle in the conventional multifamily space. So, you know, we I don't think there's any question that capital is coming from all four corners of the market, but. You know, we've had a lot of conversations, you know, Keaton and, you know, I, I can't imagine what your calendar looks like and all the calls that you're on day in and day out. I think probably 80 percent of the people that are watching this webinar have, uh, have been on your Zoom line over the course of the last few months. Why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, not only kind of how, you know, where we see capital uh, and really kind of a need to fill a hole in the capital stack and BFR, but, but, but maybe you could spend some time a little bit kind of just uh, refreshing on you know, some definitions and making sure that we are clear on the specific space that we're talking about on this call. Great. So are we switching to SFR, BFR first? Or are we, so here we go. So yep. Perfect. Um, SFR, BFR are acronyms that are often used interchangeably and they are two totally different asset classes. So SFR are scattered homes that are uh, in different geographies that are pooled together for investment purposes. So you might have 20 scattered home site homes in Phoenix, 20 in Atlanta, 30 in Houston. They're all pooled together and a loan is done on them. BFR is totally different in that it's it's contiguous, purpose-built for rent communities. So again, contiguous, purpose-built for rent communities. So SFR with the agencies with Fannie and Freddie is a bad, it's a four-letter word. They don't, they don't want to talk about it. They're not in that business. However, they are in BFR as long as we are vetting it up front to make sure it fits into their parameters. And I'll talk about that more as we go through the slides. Um, I'm going to talk about the four types of BFR. There's four different subtypes. Uh, the first type is um, called horizontal multifamily. It's very prevalent in Phoenix. Uh, groups like Next Metro, who kind of started it, and Christopher Todd, Cabin Bungalows, Empire. Um, there's literally 92 BFR uh, horizontal multifamily projects, either planning, in lease up, under construction, sold, what have you in our market. Uh, it just resembles a multifamily project. It's typically gated. It'll have a clubhouse, it'll have a pool. Um, it might have a gym. Uh, the only difference between traditional multifamily is their single level. They typically have high roofs, so no one on top of them, obviously, and then they might have some shared walls. But the biggest unit amenity that we're finding in the, in the market here is the doggy door. Literally, residents love the fact that they can go to work and their dog isn't stuck in the house. It's got a small little backyard with fake grass and a, a grill and 70% of all BFR units have pets. So that's the first form of BFR. The second form is, is two-story townhouse and single level row homes. 
Um, these are typically in the 13 to 1700 square foot range. Uh, these are being done all over the country. Uh, these, these properties might be amenitized, they might not. Um, it just depends on the economics. Obviously the, the amenity package needs to work for your economics. The third type of, of BFR is, is luxury single family. Um, these are typically um, older and more high income demographics. Um, my team is working on four of these right now, construction loans, two in California, two in Nevada. Um, are, these generally range in 2000 feet to 3000 feet. Um, the rents on the three, four deals we're looking at, the, the, the lowest rent is $4,500 per month. The top exceeds $7,000 per month. This, this, is, this product is very prevalent in the Southeastern United States. It's just single family detached, um, typically 1,400 feet to 2,200 feet. Um, again, might have amenities, might not. Um, I'm going to talk about a Nashville deal throughout this discussion that we did with Fannie Mae, but we financed a deal end of the year that I'll get to a little bit later, but it was two streets of four rent homes, no amenities. They considered the units themselves the amenities. They were three and four bedroom homes with a two car attached garage. Um, and that property had been 100% leased for two years when we financed it with Fannie. Okay. This slide I feel is the most important slide that we're trying to get some a message across to uh, all, the, all the debt sources out there. We're having no problem placing debt if it's an institutional client or a bigger deal, call it north of 30 million. It's the middle market and smaller guys that we're just, there's just not enough bank debt in the space, both on construction and in the bridge product, which again, we're gonna get to this in a little bit later, but. Chris and Heather are probably want to kill me when they hear this, but because we've had this conversation so many times, but my team, we work backwards when we look at build for rent. So what I mean by that is there's a lot of nuances to build for rent. So I get with Paul Lewicki, who's my deputy chief underwriter, and we look at the project and we make sure that it's going to qualify for Fannie or Freddie. And if it, it doesn't, what can we do to, to make that so? And we look at things like um, we look at things like, it, does it have an HOA? Do we control that HOA? If it's part of a master HOA, we have to have a sub HOA. If we have a sub HOA, are we having to contribute to the master HOA? If we're having to contribute to the master HOA, how can we limit that so the lenders get comfortable with that? So when I come to you or our team comes to you for a construction request or a bridge request, we have vetted it with Freddie and Fannie. And why is that important? <clears throat> it's important because both Fran Fannie and Freddie were there during the great financial crisis they were there early COVID and a lot of lenders were not. So other lenders are doing permanent financing on this, but we really think it's important that the agencies are there and they're not gonna do every deal. And that's why it's important that we vet them on the front. And I'll hand it over to Chris and Heather for the rest of the slide. Well, yeah, as I, I had- Good, Heather, sorry. Um, I was go gonna say, you know, as I had talked about whenever we were looking at the publics and we also recently looked at some John Burns data kind of across a broader platform of companies and you think about the myth is that there might be poor collections, but the, 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 that has not been the reality at all. Uh, that you have a stickier tenant who did everything they could to make sure that they stayed in their homes and you had strong collections. And for those that didn't collect, you ended up having some kind of workout where they're going to pay the rent at some point. Uh, poor rent growth, again, you're seeing tremendous rent growth in the space on uh, both new rent, new leases and renewals. And then those occupancy rates have just stayed exceptionally high. Uh, we monitored it started at the beginning of the beginning of the pandemic. And all of the, you know, the companies were still above 96% occupancy. So there is just the demographic trends that Chris mentioned earlier really are leading to more people, you know, heavier demand in these markets. Actually. I think it was in June or July, the American Homes for Rent said that they had a 30% uptick in just inbound calls of people trying to look to rent space, which goes to Keaton's point that there's a waiting list on some of these build for rent deals. Yeah, I, I think the points, Heather, that you're making about the resiliency really of the cash flow is, is probably a point that really gets underscored here. And, you know, we, very early on started having conversations about 
you know, what is this space? Is this single family rental, aggregated single family rental? It's just this, you know, really another iteration of multifamily. And I think what we're seeing is from a, from a demand standpoint and from a resiliency, a cash flow standpoint, this is much more multifamily than it is anything else. There are operational nuances where I think, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the build for rent space in particular is going to be able to leverage some of the tech driven management and operational platforms that really the single family REITs have pioneered uh, to where, you know, there will be operational advantages of build for rent. But I think the, the, the point that we really want to kind of get across in particular, as Keaton mentioned to the, to the lenders on the call, if we go to the next slide is, you know, this is, this is really, you know, this is multifamily. Um, that's really what we're talking about here. So Susan, if you want to go to the next slide here, I think Keaton and I'll have some thoughts about, uh, you know, kind of, you know, where we've seen some, some recent things priced. Yeah. So as Chris said, this is multifamily. And again, not every deal is going to work, but we vetted on the front end to make sure it will. Um, Walker Dunlop was the number one provider of capital to multifamily in the country last year. So we know the space well, obviously. This is the deal I talked about in Nashville. Uh, it was 34 homes on two streets, not amenitized. Um, we did a 74% loan to value loan, uh, 10 year term, three years of interest only, and then 30 year amortization thereafter. It was a 311 rate. Now that was with a 90 treasury. So that's changed a little bit. So that rate today would probably be three and a half, but it's a non-recourse loan. And we're actually in the process of doing our second loan with that same sponsor. And then I can go into some construction and, and, and bridge. So on the construction side, this is a big gap. Again, if, if, you're, if you're a big project or an institutional sponsor, you're finding debt, no problem. But if you're the middle market guy or not a big deal, um, there's just not enough banks that are in the space. And I, I don't understand that because I like it every bit as much as multifamily, to be candid, through some of the metrics that we've been talking about. So most of our clients want either non-recourse debt or recourse with burn off. So generally with banks, we're seeing non-recourse really start at 60% LTC with rates in the mid 3% to 4% range. And then deals with burn off, we're generally seeing them go as high as 75% LTC, you know, with full recourse at the closing of the loan and going to 50% at CFO and going away at some debt service coverage test. And then lastly, the debt funds, they need to be the big, be bigger deals, but the debt funds are going up to as high as in certain cases, if the metrics work on the exit to 85% of cost. Uh, obviously you're paying a higher rate for that, that leverage, but that those are non-recourse loans. But again, what we're looking for is more banks to understand the space and say, we want in. And so that's, I'll go to the next slide, Susan. And talk yeah, and Keaton, I would just I would just share with you there. You know, I saw a Q and A come coming from um, uh, from a from a viewer here asking the question if you know life companies were active in providing uh, debt for BFR for for construction um, versus permanent loans. You want to just kind of touch on the activity or relatively lack thereof uh, as it when it comes to uh, construction debt from uh, from any of the life goes. Yeah, Heather and I have been inundated with talking to different life codes. Um, I have not seen any yet that said that would said we would come in at construction. Um, I had a call with a big life company that everyone would know, household name earlier this week, and their origination staff. They're just not going to come in on construction. They will consider this strategy right here, which is bridge at certificate of occupancy, which is kind of a newer product. Um, people started talking about this at IMN. I've been going to the IMN conferences for Build for Rent for the last three years, but it was kind of a novel concept. I'm like, so I just kind of made it up that it, it existed, but it kind of didn't. So what, what this product is, is the builders mm -hmm. are actually building the, the community on their construction line. And the, our sponsors are basically taking down the units as they're delivered at certificate, certificate of occupancy. So what I love about this space for the lenders is they're really not taking construction risks, they're taking lease up risk. So, and the beauty of that is too, these homes are, are delivered in manageable tranches. So if you take a 300 unit apartment building and your first building delivers at CFO, you've got hundred units on the market, you've got hundred units to, to, to lease up. 
An example of a deal that we did with a great sponsor in North Carolina was a 94 unit at C of O deal. Our first tranche of homes was 14 homes, but the day that we got them, 11 were leased. The second tranche was 30 homes, 22 were leased. The third tranche was 30 homes, 24 were leased. So these sponsors can really manage their rent roll and how they're pushing rents. And I have not seen a deal yet that hasn't beaten its pro forma on rents. The worst I've seen is 3% over their pro forma on the highest, on, and the highest I've seen is 15%. So it's a great product. It's, you've got you've to have a couple nuances here though. The sponsor needs to be contractually obligated to purchase all of the homes. So he can't stop if something goes wrong in the economy so that you have a half built deal, Mr. Linder or Mrs. Linder. And then secondly, all these, all these groups have the right in their contract. To, if something goes wrong with the builder, if they're having financial troubles or they're not delivering product fast enough that they can replace them with another builder. And a lot of the build for rent sponsors are either builders themselves or they have builders on their teams. So there's just some nuances you have to work through this, but uh, more, more lenders need to be in the space because it always comes down to the same five or six lenders that, that are there and they're just not going to do all these deals. There's supposed to be 80,000 units of build for rent delivered this year. So it's staggering. So, you know, my team and I work on the equity side. And so all of these, you know, our clients are working with Keaton or other members of the Walker and Dunlop debt reduction staff to find construction loans or bridge loans. But we're looking at programmatic raises, especially because some of these, the dollar amount per individual property on the equity side is smaller than most, most of the larger private equity groups would want to deploy at any given time. So it makes a lot more sense to structure it as more of a programmatic venture where they're able to deploy 50, 100, $150 million at a time. The deal that you have on uh, the screen right there is a deal we closed there was a, you know, it's a total of $200 million in equity. And that'll build, call it six to $700 million worth of product. Um, the waterfall on that deal was just like you would see on a multi, traditional multifamily development deal. Um, you know, and at some point it may even get tighter. Uh, but we're seeing co-GP deals because there, you know, some of the sponsors are people who control the land, maybe still need a little extra help either on the execution of the development or balance sheet support whenever they go to develop. So we're bringing in co-GPs when it's necessary or when it's advantageous. We're raising PREF equity for some of the groups and then we're raising you know, common equity. And that can be as large as this deal. And then you know, Keaton and I are working on a deal where the equity checks about five and a half million, which is much smaller, but what gets people interested in that. And again, goes to people's interest in deploying into the space as this group has four or five other deals behind it on the pipeline. So whenever equity is looking, they're looking for a pipeline oftentimes. I mean, that's certainly going to generate a lot more interest than a one-off deal. But if you have multiple deals, if you're a strong sponsor, and if either if you have really good operational experience on the multifamily side, or you have really good access to the land, because the land ultimately is what is going to be in short supply. But we are continuing to see new people come into the space all the time both on the build to rent and on the build to core. I mean, it's not build to rent, rather, sorry. It's all build to rent. <laughs> but on the, um, on the merchant build or on the build to core. And then we have some people in the middle. So we have some groups that are interested in deploying the capital. Developers are controlling the land. They're willing to come in, allow them to build it, and then have some kind of crystallization on the back end where then the equity group takes over. So that way they can keep it in their portfolio for a longer term. And you made a you made a comment in there, uh, kind of in passing, uh, that I think you know should should really be uh, reiterated. I, I I think we've we've moved into this you know place where it's it, it's really kind of a tale of two markets. And and Keaton referred to it earlier. You've got you know larger national platforms, whether it be national merchant build platforms that have been very effective in raising capital into the space. Obviously, uh, you know some of the larger public home builders have been prolific in this space. You know, there, there's there's really no shortage of capital for for those uh, market participants, but you you really do have a dearth of capital in you know what is a very robust middle market space. Um, 
And so as we, as we kind of navigate, you know, through this, really the, the, the one thing that probably becomes more scarce than anything is, is finished lot inventory. And, um, you know, the observations that we have in the Southeast is, you know, post uh, GFC, you know, the, the, the land development market, as well as the land development lending space, those, those banks, basically with those community banks, those dirt banks that were super active in that horizontal financing of that horizontal development space, they've all been removed from the market. So you've either got your large publics that have been able to aggregate and finance that lot development, or you're left with private, you know, land developers that have had to absorb, you know, very expensive capital stacks with MES, low leverage. It's really kind of reduced the amount of lot inventory that's further exacerbated the shortage issue that we talked about on the top end of the call. So, you know, as, as, as we continue to work through finding opportunities for the capital that's been committed to the space, ultimately it will be the builders and the developers that can control the lot inventory that will really be um, you know, creating a tremendous amount of value to the capital that's trying to get deployed into the space. Keaton, I don't know if you have any observations on that front as well. No, Chris, that's a great observation. I mean, Heather and my team talk with people that want to get in the space and they're being very creative. Uh, we've got a client based out of California that's really wants to do a lot of this. And he's just, he's approaching all of the home builders. He just wants to get in front of them. So we're, we're dealing with land brokers in every state that he's interested in it. And he's building the pipeline, but people are willing to come in and be your equity. If you're the builder, they're willing to buy at CFO, like we talked about. Um, it's just, people are getting very creative because they're trying to build pipeline and it's just, it's evolving every day. So, you know, I would, I would just add that, you know, to the participants and the, the, the audience on the call, um, you know, I, I, I alluded to it earlier, but I think that if, if, if Keaton and Heather wanted to book their calendar full of 45 minute Zoom calls that focused in on build for rent and single family rental eight hours a day for the next, they'd probably be booked all the way through July 4th. So um, it's a, we're tremendously active in the space. If you're seeing opportunities, if you're, you know, attempting to allocate capital in the space, um, you know, if you are trying to really size up the appropriate entry point on the lending front, um, you know, we, we would invite you to reach out to one of the 16 individuals that, you know, are on this dedicated practice group here at WND. If you're still trying to formulate your thesis and trying to understand exactly where you want to try and play in the space, whether it's you know visiting with members of your credit team or or your acquisition teams, we uh, we're, we're we're happy to, to to be of a service and, and foster those conversations. So we've had a a couple of uh, questions that were pre-submitted uh, by the attendees, and we've had a couple come up in the live Q and A. Um, the first one that kind of caught you know our attention uh, was asking you know the, the the panel to give some details on current construction costs in the Southeast and how that compares to traditional multifamily. Um, our team here in Atlanta um, actually uh, priced an opportunity in, in Atlanta just yesterday um, with a with one of the larger private builders here. Uh, in the market. And I think if we look at kind of an apples to, you know, try to make an apples to apples comparison, you know, three story walk up surface park garden product versus uh, three and four bedroom homes and build for rent. What we're seeing is, is about a 30 to $40 delta uh, just in the hard cost. Obviously the BFR is going to be a larger footprint. So that's going to be a larger uh, just absolute dollar number, uh, but about a 30 to $40 delta. Uh, uh, reduction uh, in the hard cost levels. I think one of the one of the challenges and one of the stresses in the system right now is the 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 single family builders are so much more efficient at delivering the product. Um, you know, clearly the development community will lean on that infrastructure uh, for for construction. The, the 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 challenge is the the lion's share, particularly these private builders, you know, they're not staffed with the resources 
to be constantly churning out, uh, you know, cost estimates and quotes in the same way that your, you know, larger conventional GC in the multifamily space might be. Um, so we've, we've, we've had a number of instances where some of the, you know, kind of go-to home builders across the Southeast, um, you know, maybe that segment just below uh, the national home builders are really kind of, you know, resource constrained uh, when it comes to supplying information for developers as they're sizing up potential land opportunities. And that's making it even more challenging to secure sites in a, uh, in a very competitive environment. So, um, Keaton, I don't know if you were, or uh, uh, if you have any other you know, thoughts on, on, on the cost environment or Heather? We are seeing cost estimates go up in the last month. I mean, we just had them come in on the actual like, vertical portion because of lumber is going up. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see kind of how these budgets shake out over the next 30 to 60 days. I mean, there's other opportunities for cost saving, but lumber right now is having, I mean, just this little micro moment is having an impact on the budgets pretty considerably. Yeah, we have a deal in the Southeast that we were getting ready to take to market for a July one funding and they got their new cost numbers back a couple of days ago and they decided to kind of wait till a September funding just to see if they can value engineer and get some costs to come back. And the other problems in the Southeast developers are having is everyone's so busy. So they're just waiting for costs to come down, do some value engineering. But most of the bigger BFR deals are, can absorb that. It's the smaller ones that really can't. Like the Heather, the deal that Heather and I are working on in San Antonio, she mentioned it's a smaller deal and the costs are up and we're, we're debating whether the deal even works right now. So. Yeah, I would think that with the, you know, shortage of inventory, um, the hyper competitive market uh, to secure land, the pressure that we have uh, in the labor market, uh, coupled with you know rising you know material costs, um, um, you know this is a this is a personal opinion here, but um, it, it feels as though the idea that you're going to sit on the sidelines and wait for costs to come back in, um, you know that 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 might be a that might be quite a long way. Uh, so. Uh, we've got a, um, a couple of questions about small balance. Uh, one came in about, you know, sub $10 million loans um, with, you know, kind of needs for a light lift and renovation. I, I you know, I, I, I'll kick this over to you, Keaton. My, my, my sense is, is, uh, is there's a relatively deep market in the existing side, uh, knowing how liquid the value add, you know, uh, multifamily market has been. Uh, on both the debt and equity front, are you you know seeing a decent level of activity in some of your uh, smaller balance loans uh, on existing and repositioning opportunities? Not really. We we were joking on a call earlier this week that Chris, I don't know if you were on that call or not, that we should start creating a value add fund for build for five years from now when their <laughs> their amenity packages are old now and we can just start redoing them, just like the multifamily market. We've we've sifted through all the build the value add. It's hard to find that product today, but maybe that's the next step in build for rent. But no, we haven't seen it much of that right now. Uh, there was a question about, uh, and I think this is important, and this is where, you know, some of the single family builders might really need to lean on the multifamily developers and their experience for creating place. Um, but just, you know, a bit of a technical question about, um, you know, putting these, you know, uh, developments together. Are the streets and uh, most of your build for rent deals uh, publicly dedicated, uh, and speak a little bit to what you've seen with kind of uh, single versus uh, uh, multi-plot um, uh, sites, Keaton. Uh, the answer on the streets question is both. Sometimes they're private streets, like if you're a Christopher Todd deal, or you know that's a, encapsulated inside of it. That that's your streets. But we are seeing some like the Nashville deal that was public streets. Um, on the single plat versus multi-plat, uh, Fannie and Freddie will do both. Uh, what's interesting, though, is on the single plat, typically you're talking to the multifamily side of the bank, and on the multi-plot, you end up talking to the builder side of the bank, which I don't know that that makes sense. I, I feel like it should be the multi-side of the house, because I really feel like it is multifamily. Um, and again, it's, it's our job to vet out the problems that will exist for Freddie and Fannie, but we do that on the front end. But it's, it's both multi-plat 
and single plat. Chris, there's a question about BTR product based on sales comp for for sale housing versus cap rates. Mm -hmm. And we would say, at least on the initial development side, people look at what where for sale housing is because that they look at it in terms of rent, et cetera. But really, it's based on cap rates to cash flow, um, which the, and those cap rates have, have narrowed considerably in the last 12 months. So you have a number of trades that have happened in Phoenix, and they're in the low fours on a cap rate perspective now. Yeah, I, I, I would say unequivocally, Heather, that you know we are on a path uh, to build for rent trading at, at parity with conventional multifamily cap rates. Um, you know, interestingly enough, we were. Um, uh, in a conversation with a with a with a builder here in the southeast, and uh, you know potential programmatic you know JV equity provider uh, for new construction, and um, you know I was really you know surprised that not only do they feel like on exit these will be trading at parity uh, with conventional multifamily, but they were really looking at comparable development yields that they would be looking at. Uh, in the conventional, you know, ground up space and, um, and really using that as kind of a key underwriting metric to filter out opportunities that they were going to engage in or not. Uh, there was a question about promote structure. Um, you know, I think Heather, you touched on this a little bit, but I, I would say in general, uh, the promote structures that we're seeing uh, in the ground up space here uh, really kind of mirror that of, of conventional equity. I think the question is, uh, is the is the LP, you know, is their ultimate objective uh, to really kind of aggregate a portfolio, build a current income vehicle? That's where the kind of crystallization conversations that Heather mentioned kind of come into play. Uh, but outside of that, an emergent build opportunity, we really see those waterfalls uh, almost mirroring conventional multifamily opportunities. A couple more questions here. Uh, we've got... Um, you know, the question about BFR working in high tax, cold climates, uh, and, and a question about expense ratios. Um, you know, I, I, I would see that I would say that we've observed some opportunities uh, across the Midwest. Um, we've seen uh, a little bit of activity in the Northeast, but it really kind of pales in comparison to the conversations that we've been having, uh, you know, across the Sun Belt. I think that's a bit of a, a function of belief in the, the, the secular shift of this idea that if 10% of the workforce in a post-COVID world has the ability to go from high cost to low cost, you know, pick their climate, move across state lines, really has the ability to work remotely uh, into perpetuity, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about, you know, 17 or 18 million folks in the workforce that, you know, are now going to be um, relocating or potentially have the option to relocate. And so, you know, that, that, that secular trip, secular shift, excuse me, um, seems to really be kind of pointing, you know, towards the sunbelt. But we do have some, some deals that we're working on in the Midwest and the benefits to those, I mean, the, the expense ratios, obviously we don't have very many comps to, to look, to point to on that, but Get, I mean, compared to their multifamily counterparts, you get basements. I think maybe they're unfinished, but still a basement. And you have a direct access garage. So when you think about just the, the leasing there, people are going to be willing to pay more for a direct access garage in a favorite climate. So I think it still is a compelling investment and a compelling strategy, even in markets that aren't quite as hot from a job growth perspective like the Sunbelt. And I would imagine that the, you know, inventory issues that we, that we referenced earlier, Heather, you know, those are markets that have had, you know, historically, you know, less than one or 2% uh, of the total multifamily inventory kind of in the development pipeline year in, year out, um, you know, probably more inventory shortages there in the event right. that they do experience some, some population yeah. migration. Keaton, this is a bit of a softball. Where has the most activity been for build for rent top three markets? <laughs> well, it, it's uh, so Phoenix again is heavy on the horizontal multifamily, but Phoenix thinks that the rest of the world, they think that's build for rent period. Like they don't understand that the single family detached is is pretty predominant in the Southeast. So I'd say that the, the Carolinas, North and South Carolina, 
Georgia, Tennessee, certain markets in Florida, Orlando, Tampa, Jacksonville, uh, all very hot markets. But did you get uh, Texas, Keaton? Did you skip over Texas? You know, Texas is strong, but everyone kind of freaks out on the property taxes. So well, that that is true. But we do have a lot of. I mean, we're seeing the continuum. We're seeing horizontal multi, a lot of townhomes, not quite as many of the single family detached in Texas, but still there, we have people coming into Texas, I mean. No, I, I have a client that has an agreement with a big uh, master plan builder in Texas to basically take down 2,700 units within their various communities um, and do build for rent. So the master plan is saying, look, I'm, I'm reducing my land basis. And that's a deal where we're working through uh, a master HOA. We're going to have a sub HOA. We do have to have a contribution to the master. And do we do that with a, a CPI limiter? Do we do that with a, a, a percent limiter? What do we do? But the, the master developer is very motivated to do this because our guy is going to build 2,700 units. And he's actually going to build them and sell them at CFO. So we're introducing him to a prethora of people to buy his product at CFO. You know, it's it, it's interesting, Keaton. One of the other trends that I think we've we've seen that is somewhat surprising to me, and it gets back to that scarcity of lot inventory com comment. Um, you know, some of the larger builders across the Southeast, you know, builders that have pipelines of call it, you know, five to 8,000 lots, um, their businesses have been so profitable for, you know, the past 12 months that, you know, that lot inventory is really their holy grail. And they are very reluctant uh, to part with, say, you know, 25%, you know, carve out 2,000 of the 8,000 lots that are currently under their inventory and, and cannibalize really their, their kind of core business. And so they're, they're going to continue to focus on the core business and the existing lot inventories and the existing pipeline, uh, and then really view kind of the build for rent space as an opportunity to go in and ramp up the construction side of their business elevate themselves on various league tables in terms of number of starts per year, uh, help fund additional overhead within the firm. Also, uh, the economies of scale and the purchasing power that comes with, you know, that increased size on the construction side. Uh, but again, we've seen them very reluctant. You know, I think there was this idea, you know, six months ago that you were going to be able to go straight to the home builders and say, you know, I will pre-purchase you know, 30% of the neighborhoods that you have in the queue. Um, and that it, it, it seems to be a little bit uh, more challenging than, uh, than we might've originally expected. Well, to, 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 I, I think there's a lot of BFR people that when COVID happened, they were licking their chops, thinking that the retail sales on homes were gonna plummet and it didn't, right? So the retail sales are going off the charts. So people don't wanna give up the, their lots. But I would make an argument that at some point, Retail is going to shift. So why not be doing a little bit of a combination of both? Um, you know, because you, you're selling, you're not having to deal with 100 people buying 100 homes. You're dealing with one group buying 100 homes. So it helps your delivery schedule. It keeps your crews busy. I'm making that argument because I want to lend on the space. So it's kind of a greedy uh, point, I guess. Uh, there was a, a point, I think this is a, a maybe underscore Keaton, one of the points that you've really been making very consistently over the course of the last nine or 10 months as I've been on calls with you, with your clients, um, you're currently considering a loan on a bill for rent project that contains a mix of townhomes, single family and conventional apartment units. Will the agencies look at permanent financing differently on a project with a mix of units? This really underscores your point of, of beginning with the end in mind. So you wanna give, you know, kind of reiterate some thoughts there? Yeah, I, I would, again, I'd want to look at the layout. We are looking at some stuff like that right now. We're looking at a deal here in Phoenix that's fairly large with a very qualified multifamily developer. So he's looking to build like a village concept. It's it's about 600 units in total. So he's looking at doing, obviously the build for rent is, is low density, right? So you're talking eight to 12 units per acre. So he's going to build a combination of garden style and single family throughout. Um, so we're going to be vetting that shortly with Paul. 
Um, but I, I think that works and it makes sense because now you've built garden style, you know, your, your density there is 28 per acre. And then you've got the eight to 13 per acre, but he's, he's, it's, it's a really nice deal. And it's, it looks like a village the way he's doing it. So the answer is yes, but I would want to vet it on the front end. And, you know, Heather, you might have some thoughts on this, but, um, you know, I, I think whenever we see, uh, you know, an asset that has a, a mix of product, um, you know, not only uh, does it seem to resonate with the ultimate user and the, and, and, and the residential and the, and the, the resident community, um, you know, when we're working on assets that have a little bit of, of variety in terms of product offering, you know, if, if thoughtfully laid out, as Keaton mentioned, um, you know, we typically see, you know, increased liquidity on the equity side uh, for projects like that. No, I would agree with you on that. You have one in the market in Texas right now, actually, that's a mix yep. of basically duplex single family built for rent and then some garden apartments. So it would um, be a we good metric. We've gotten a couple of questions, Keaton, about um, how lenders are, are looking at, at, at CapEx reserves and, um, and you know, how that's kind of evolving and maybe how that uh, is impacted, you know, as you move across, uh, you know, different climates. You want to talk a little bit about kind of what you've seen on the, on the CapEx reserve front? Yeah, it's very interesting. And Chris, you and I have had this conversation as well. Some of these builders are delivering product with a with a 10-year home warranty. So, I mean, where's your R&M on that deal? So how are you underwriting that? But typically we're going to underwrite it just like a multi-deal. Where's the engineering report? Um, so 250 a unit is normal, um, but it's, it's no different than multifamily how we're underwriting it. Really, it's just off the engineering report. Got it. Um, and we're, we're, we're coming up to time here. So maybe um, time for one or two more um, question about exit strategies. And, um, you know, if, if we've seen any, uh, any activity where there's been say a 10 year hold with the thought of, you know, selling the individual homes, you know, to the user at the end of a 10 year period, um, Heather, you've done a lot on, you know, the JV equity front, have you, have you seen any sponsors coming to you with the idea of, a, of an individual home sale exit? You know, we really haven't. I would say this time last year, people would talk about having the benefit of having the individually platted purpose-built communities that you have that flexibility of exit, but we have not heard anyone talk about that in the last six months. But most people are thinking once it's a rental because of you know, your cap on, on income, it just doesn't make sense. But in theory, I mean, people would talk about that being you know, one of the benefits, but they don't anymore, really. I'm mean, Keaton, are you, would you agree? Yeah, I agree. And you know, obviously if, if you're doing a Fannie or Freddie loan on the product, you're gonna have to pay them off hundred percent. I mean, they're not gonna do releases. So you're gonna be deed restricted to have rent only. So we've had a few people talk about how that's a benefit because you've got multiple exits, but I have seen no one executing on that plan. Right. Well, we're, uh, we're, we're coming up uh, against uh, the bottom of the hour here. I, I, I would, I would um, just reiterate a few points. I mean, one, um, you know, this is still a nascent space. So the importance of, um, you know, having a practice group that's formed together, that's highly communicative, communicative and, and collaborate and share best practices, I think is very important. We've assembled that team at WND. So in the, in the event that you have any questions or thoughts, uh, or would like to tap into any of those collective resources, uh, please reach out to your you know, relationship manager at Walker and Dunlop or, or contact any of the 16 folks that are, have their contact information listed in that practice group. We'd be uh, happy to help in, in any way possible. So hope everyone has a, a great Thursday afternoon and thanks for dialing in. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Keaton.